begin. Welcome back everyone to the second panel today on resistance and social movements. We have three wonderful speakers. I'm really delighted to be sort of um, welcome introducing them and moderating this session. Um, I'll introduce them one by one and if you could, I mean we're now asking you to raise your hand if you want to ask questions directly towards the and, and all of the questions will happen towards the end of the presentation. So if you could raise your hands if you want to ask directly or send to me via chat, that would be great. Um, so I will begin with welcoming um, and introducing Samina Lutfer, who is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Dhaka. She is an activist researcher and a playwright actor working on environmental and social justice movements, political ecology, gender, popular culture, and media. Her current work is on the politics of the female apparel workers, theater actors, environmental activists, and farmers in Bangladesh. She also works on popular culture and media, creative and emotional works in political protests. Welcome, Nitra, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Laili, and uh, all the organizers for giving me the chance to present this uh, here. Um, this is uh, still a work in progress, so uh, I am quite tensed uh, to present it in front of my peers. Uh, so let me share my screen. Can you see? Okay. So um, I, I will try to look um, into the uh, sort of Im impact of repression and how uh, the masses were resilient uh, to these kind of repressions uh, in two different cases, one in the Fulbari uh, movement, and the other is a more recent movement of Mirapod Sharokandalan in Bangladesh. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, in this uh, presentation, I will just try to um, focus on what happened in Fulbari and what happened during the Nirapod Sharokandalan in 2018. Uh, I'll talk about the methods uh, very briefly and the three major conceptual um, uh, tools that I use in this um, paper is uh, emotion, obligation, and uh, state forces and media. Uh, when we look at Fulbari Andalon, what happened during um, that um, is uh, probably some people might not know. So it started with in 1994, where a uh, proposal of the mine, uh, an open cast coal mine was actually um, launched by BHP Billiton. Uh, in 1998, they transferred the lease to Asia Energy Corporation and Asia Energy started to work in the area in 2004. Uh, by 2005, locals started to protest against the mining project after the social impact assessment survey. And uh, on 26th August of 2006, local protesters announced a girao of the mining company's office in Fulbury, which is in Dinashpur, a northern district of Bangladesh. On the Chabishe, uh, that is how uh, the local protesters um, remember the day, um, Chabishe, which is Chabishe August um, or 26th August. The thousands of people, they gathered to blockade the company's office in Fulbury. Government security forces opened fire with live ammunition that killed three people and injured hundreds. Protests escalated to the highest degree. Protesters gained control over the town and after only four days of protests, they forced the government to suspend the mining project. Negative press coverage in national and transnational media tarnished the UK-based company's image permanently. And therefore, the company's share price plummeted in London's alternative investment market. In 2007, military-backed caretaker government came to power in Bangladesh. That's when transnational human rights organizations were alerted uh, about the situation in Fulbury. Uh, with, by uh, 2011, withdrawal of most of the financial backers who were very uh, 
powerful backers like um, Asian Development Bank and other IFIs uh, were already withdrawn from the project because of the uh, transnational coalition of activism against the Fulbury open cast coal mine. But this resistance continues today transnationally because um, uh, the company in, with a different name, uh, Global Coal Resource Management, uh, still operates in London's AIM. And that's where most of the activism is now concentrated. What happened in the other, the second case that I look at is the Nirapur Sharok Andalun and what happened during uh, those days in 2018. Uh, it was a more short lived one. Uh, so it started from the end of July and it uh, went uh, through uh, the first week of August. Uh, 29th of July 2018, the demonstration was sparked by killing of two college students by three speeding buses near Kumitola Hospital in Dhaka. Uh, Minister of Shipping and the leader of Bangladesh's road transport workers, Mr. Shajan Khan, uh, remarked something about the uh, 33 deaths in India and how they don't say much about this. Uh, and his uh, very infamous smile came under criticism and triggered protests in other areas of the country. On the 30th July, we saw that the roads were under students' control, nine point demands were announced. Uh, the next day, students again took over Dhaka City Road intersection. They started to check documents of vehicles and took over traffic duties. Uh, first and second August, Dhaka was still under siege and students from universities also joined the movement. Uh, before the first or the second of August, it was mostly uh, uh, done by the students of schools and colleges. Um, so the Prime Minister asked Bangladesh Chatra League to convince protesting students and government shut down educational institutions to quell the protests. Violence started, police and Al Falima, which is our league activists, bounced on children and university students on the roads. Rumors afloat social media. Uh, on the 3rd of August, media demonized, started to demonize protesters and underscored government's measures uh, to accept their demands. On the 4th of August, we see more protesters pour in and take over roads, uh, brutally attacked by uh, the VCL and Jubilee activists under police watch, which was a very important part of this attack and this repression. Uh, um, uh, journalists came under attack as well uh, from helmet wearing, mashed wielding wounds. Science lab, Mirpur, Jigatola, these were the parts of Dhaka which experienced most violent altercations. Rumors and arrests were going on. We saw actress Noshaba getting arrested. On the 5th of August, DU students came, sorry. DU students came out in solidarity and they were brutally attacked and injured. Uh, on, from 6th August onwards, we have seen a lot of arrests. I saw uh, a photographer Shoydul Alam and many other students and activists. Students protests were quelled, road safety law was passed, other solidarity protests continued. So, uh, so what? So these are the two cases, what happened, we saw, and uh, uh, some scholars um, suggested that repression would have an immediate negative impact on subsequent protest events, or could cause future uh, participation to be limited to reduced risk tactics of dissent, rather than high risk tactics of dissent. So in the case of the Fulbury resistance, um, the opposite transpired, because we saw that after the uh, repression uh, movement, actually moved, the force of the movement increased. Uh, but in the case of the NSA 1.0, which I say because it, the second phase has just started after I uh, proposed this um, uh, paper to be presented in this conference. So the waves of protests started to fade after repression and arrest. So when we um, look at these two different um, uh, protest movements, uh, our question is, did state-led um, violence lead stronger mobilization or weaker in case of these two different cases? So in order to answer that question, I would answer three questions. Um, so which are after repression, do emotion influence sparks of protest or not? What capacity and tactics of mobilization generate more support post-violence? Uh, how did the performance of the government and media influence the events unfolding after the violence? So um, as a methodology, this is uh, the first part of the paper. The first case, Fulbury Movement, is part of my um, DPhil dissertation. And uh, there were a lot of uh, interviews taken in Fulbury, Dhaka, and London. Uh, for the second uh, case, I took um, uh, semi-structured uh, qualitative interviews with in Dhaka with uh, you know, some uh, activists and also narratives um, from the protester, which are 
collected from secondary sources. So in this um, uh, project, I want to look at um, uh, uh, resistance or movement as a sort of transversal politics where uh, there are different perceptions of what is happening at the same time. Uh, and these can actually effectively assemble a, a map the different standpoints to present us with a more encompassing college of uh, the aftermath of repression in Fulbury in 2006 and in Dhaka in 2018. So uh, that's the sort of methods part. Uh, if we go into the first uh, conceptual tool that I use is uh, whether emotion influences protest. Uh, there is a lot of literature which uh, suggests that emotions are constitutive of social relations and actions uh, that are actually encountered as emotionally, should be encountered as emotionally laden, relational, hybrid, corporal, and contingent. Uh, it's not only individuals. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a lot of... Um, um, literature actually at the now uh, that accepts the fact that emotion is not necessarily a bad thing for a movement. Uh, there was a time when uh, a lot of theory uh, scholars would reject um, using emotion uh, to uh, explain collective action uh, because that um, was, they, they figured it was not rational enough. Uh, but emotions are in this paper are used not as opposed to reason, um, it's a, we are more interested to look at how um, emotions can channel motivation um, uh, through reflexive versus affective emotions. And just to um, uh, elaborate a bit more, reflexive emotional mechanism like anger or panic can actually turn into indignation and apathy, uh, which is a very complex process and which is a long-term basis. And uh, it uh, can motivate um, actions or inaction. Um, uh, so these, this is kind of uh, the theoretical background on the basis of which I would look whether it or how it worked in Fulbury and uh, NSA. After state forces killed, um, uh, instead of protecting the citizens in Fulbury in 2006, massive emotional commotion overshadowed the cost of high-risk behaviors. Uh, and uh, all the uh, interviews I took uh, during that time, it, uh, it was uh, uh, there was a lot of um, information about how uh, they felt uh, emotionally perplexed. This is something that came up uh, quite often in my interviews. And uh, uh, the state-led violence was, um, uh, they thought that the most obvious response to this violence was uh, to uh, start follow-up protests rather than going back home. Because state forces used um, uh, excessive force that, uh, that created a feeling that um, uh, not protesting was not actually going to help them uh, to, be, to remain safe. Uh, so this, there was a blanket violence. So after the killing of the, um, of the three um, young uh, protesters in Fulbury, there was a lot of uh, baton charges and violence uh, throughout the whole uh, town. And uh, people were indiscriminately um, beaten up and uh, 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 that's why uh, people of the town kind of figured out that it's not actually going to help them but by not following up uh, in, in new movement. Uh, in case of uh, Nirapot Shorokandolong, the first phase, um, the first spark was the loss of two young lives. That's for sure in the beginning that created the outrage or the anger, the audacious response of the minister for the pro protest. But and the students were angry. However, they did not see any other form of action than protesting on the streets and solving traffic problems themselves. So police repression in the form of tear gas, baton charges dispersed them, but they came back in more numbers in the next day. So we can see somewhat similarity with Fulbury movement that um, although there was repression, they still came out and uh, start, um, uh, continued their protest. Um, and their uh, emotions were expressed through the slogans and the Blackets that they were carrying. Uh, when young students were beaten by the helmet wearing activists of the of BCL and JCL um, and, and the jail um, jubilee, uh, older students join in to protest the injustice and violence. So this is something which um, I think uh, I need to sort of um, uh, under, um, underline that uh, in these bo both of these uh, movements, I see emotional perplexity. If, People are unsure of what to uh, feel, but they are angry and they also are um, uh, fearful of what uh, the government or the uh, violent um, activists are going to uh, invoke on them. 
So from that violence, from that uh, emotion uh, that actually uh, in both cases uh, transformed into some sort of an obligation. Uh, I would um, uh, not go on to quote the read, read out the both the quotes. Uh, the first one is from Fulbury, uh, which was taken in 2010. And the second one is, uh, uh, from the NSA or uh, Nira Pachora Kandalon, which, uh, which was taken in 2021. Uh, so these, both of these protesters are talking about the fact that they want to go to the protest because they, uh, it, it's a, for the sake of, uh, of the people who died, for the sake of uh, the people who are being beaten up or being uh, you know, facing violence against them. Um, and also in case of Fulbury, we specifically saw that they uh, kept on uh, kept on telling how their um, they had um, their brother's bloods on their hands. So we are here at Fulbury and we could not run away. Why would we? And uh, you have to answer why our brothers are dead. Some things like that. So repression that killed their pe their people incited anger and frustration and fear. However, continued repression by state forces did not leave not protesting as an option. So they went on, they felt obligated to protest. In case of uh, the Nirapur Shorog Andalon, the placards actually uh, showed us the, that obligation, but it had a more broader uh, uh, side to it. So Amar Bhai Kobore, Kunikano Baire, these are the sort of the things that they uh, had in the, in the placards. Also, Jodi Tumi Bhai Pauta, Tumi Shesh, Jodi Tumi Rukhetara, Tumi Bangladesh. These are kind of um, uh, the, uh, the way they were um, showing their um, obligation, but uh, obligation not only to the, uh, the lives lost or to, to the people who are being violated, but also um, uh, like uh, there were placards that uh, read reconstruction of the state continues, Rashtri Meramot uh, or Manani Pradhan Montri Apna License. These kind of things were there. And um, so movement for safe roads were also showing obligation to change larger structural problems. And one of the protesters, um, uh, uh, quote, I want to read, uh, uh, she said, it was such a beautiful movement. How can anyone not join? I wanted to participate everywhere. So it's kind of like an obligation because the younger generation were trying to fix things that were wrong and uh, the older generation uh, felt the obligation to attend and join the movement. While strategizing this obligation, protesters in both cases viewed the loss of innocent lives either due to violent repression or unsafe roads as a violation of their community and transformed this violation into the community's sense of duty to dissent. Uh, and I conceptualize this sense of duty as a kind of like a fard, a fard kifaya, a community's obligation to the deceased. In this case, the obligation to the dead was to stay together and to keep the protest alive. Uh, in Muslim communities, funeral prayers or janatar is one of the rights that a deceased has over uh, other Muslims. Uh, it is a further kifaya, an obligation that at least some Muslims in a community must discharge on behalf of the community as a whole. So participation in a funeral procession is thus a necessary act for those Muslims who would stand for the rest. Um, Rustler, for example, explained similar kind of things in, in Iranian uh, revolution where he reported similar effects. Um, in case of strategizing the obligation in Fulbury, we saw that they actually organized a guy on the 27th so that they could actually um, camouflage it as a community duty. But actually what happened was they were trying to break the curfew. Uh, so this was actually a strategy uh, that they took that they asked people that at least you need to be on the janaza because it's a community obligation. And by being present in the janaza, you are actually uh, doing two things. One is you are, uh, uh, do, you're keeping your religious um, obligation as well you are keeping your obligation to dissent because of the uh, because uh, of the people who died and for their sake for uh, justice to be served so this is important aspect of the Pulveri movement where they strategically used a cultural um, um, practice uh, of the of the masses uh, to um, uh, to use it as a repertoire, as a tool of, um, uh, of protest, as well as to create the collective identity uh, of obligation among, within the uh, protesters within the community. 
Uh, but in case of Nirapod Shorok Andalon, we didn't see that much of a translation. Uh, the movement was more fluid with no core organizing actors, which was not the case with Pulvari. It was very um, organized from a very uh, long time. Um, uh, so in, in case of NSA, they were much younger and inexperienced and therefore uh, were brave, but could not strategize against a heavy handed state. Uh, they were demonized in the media for some of their new ideas and innovative strategies. They were more popular among the general populace than the elites. Therefore, their framing was often criticized as vulgar and obscene. Uh, and the older students felt some obligation. However, it was not translated across class and age of other citizens. So the third conceptual tool that I want to bring into this discussion is the role of government and the media. In Fulbury in 2006, we, we probably would remember that we still had a democratically elected government that had to face the consequence of non-accountability in the upcoming elections. Uh, electronic media were more efficient. Electronic media was more efficient uh, than um, the print media back in those days. From Tabisha, all uh, satellite channels were broadcasting live coverage of the events unfolding the violent episode, which actually helped the townspeople to see what was happening at other parts of the town. Um, um, yeah, so I will wrap up uh, with the last uh, thing that the, uh, in case of the NSA or uh, uh, the Nirapod Shorok Andalon, uh, we saw that um, uh, we had a larger number of satellite television channels in 2018, but not a government that was worried about accountability to its citizens. The infamous ICT Act was already there and much more repressive regime against information and freedom of expression. Government was brutal in repressing the dissent in the name of involvement of Jamaat and BNP among the protesters. So the first few days, media actually favored the protesters, but the later days, they demonized them for being vulgar and obscene, using bad languages and being unruly and overstepping their limits. Though so, uh, the youngsters connected with world famous YouTubers and content creators to garner support from the international media. The government did not pay heed to those new media based international noise, but Al Jazeera interview of Mr. Shoydul Alam seemed to make them more angry. So, this is something which uh, we, uh, uh, I would uh, wrap up with, with this last slide where. I want to um, underline the fact that the nature and the level of democratic space available determine the end result for NSA or Fulbury. So despite facing a lot of repression by the activists, their predict the predicament of the uh, activists were reduced to rumor mongering, overstepping boundaries and breaking of ICT Act. Uh, government even slowed down internet, uh, uh, closed all the schools. In case of Fulbury, that sort of control over media was yet to become the reality. However, the long-term affective emotion of apathy created through the gagging of the dissent in 2018 has come to a full circle to regenerate NSA phase two in November 2021. Further research on both versions are needed. I thank you for listening to me for so long, giving me the chance to talk about this. Uh, however, this is a work in progress and I still need to do a lot more. Thank you. Thanks, Nitra. That was amazing. There's such a rich paper and there's so many questions here around registers and vocabularies of process and technologies. I'm Excited. I've got questions already, uh, but I'll hold them and I'll move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Maureen Zalal Chaudhry, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at Brack University, Dhaka. He obtained his PhD in anthropology from Hiroshima University following a postdoctorate. His core research areas focus on technology, society, social media, social movement, STS studies, online-based online activism, social resistance, online political public sphere, and anti-corruption um, initiatives. We're delighted to have you here, and over to you, Moin. So can everybody see my slides? Yes. Yep. Up. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I will start with the comment from Shopan Adnan. He was very rightly put that there is there are multiple others. So when we are talking about Shahabag movement yeah, back in 2013, uh, the dominant narratives often tell us that there is only one other, and that is the uh, Jamaat or other factor. So one of the key points from my side is that, is my slides moving? Okay, good. So uh, for give you the global context, and also from Laili Uddin that she was mentioning about occupying space, 
I think that would be a fascinating uh, part for you to uh, connect is that from 2010 onwards, protests erupted in thousands of cities over the 100 countries around the world. Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Gezi Park movement, uh, uh, Me Too, what, which is continuing right now, uh, Black Lives Matter and so on. So they have protested against authoritarian regime, demanded democracy, equal rights and so on. These protests have been some of the largest in history, unprecedented in their respective nature. And back in 2012, I have done my second master's kind of predicting the uh, main issue of what is going on in the Bangla blogosphere called liberation versus Jamaat issue in Bangla blogosphere. So uh, back on that, uh, one of the key aspect I'll take from uh, Professor Syed Ferdus is that when we are historicizing uh, how things are going on, we often make a very linear dimension, often missing the uh, localization of internet, localization of internet-based uh, activism in Bangladesh case. So this part you must, uh, I think, allow me to uh, include is that since 2006, block sites promoted an NML Bengali writing, uh, being internet beginning digital resistance and social media activism, introduction of online news agencies. So neoliberal economy uh, invaded Bangladesh in much earlier stage through the development of technology, these things made possible. 2007, rise of Bangla blogosphere in that sense. 2018 and nine, 2008 and nine, introduction of moderation blog where citizen journalism bloggers are during national election and media cleaning. They are really mm, providing very influential Mm, mm, roles. 2010 and 12 onwards, corporate interest grew to employ bloggers to promote their products, what we see right now, everywhere promoters of product through social media. And 2011, online-based digital activist protest network, Boan I, before Boan, 2011, Boan I uh, born. And 2013, we see Shahbag movement initiated by the bloggers and online activists. One of the key feature of this part is that we should remember the concept of Adda that has been engraved in our culture. And one of the key feature of this part is that Adda from the physical space during the development of Bangla blogosphere transferred into the online space of uh, Bangladesh, namely Bangla blog blogosphere. So <clears throat> digital activism before Shahabag, as you can see, that there are many issues hmm, under the radar of mainstream partisan politics. There are many issues where bloggers and activists have been participated. Pro protest against VAT agreement in private universities, movement against 24-7 act in Jagannath uh, University, citizen journalism in national election, protest against bringing dead body of war criminal of Bangladesh. And that is one of the case of uh, Raja Chakma, what was mentioned by um, uh, Adnan. So Shopnadnan. Uh, so this part, what we go, what is my engagement? Uh, I have participated in the Shahbag movement, one of the organizers. Uh, before that, uh, I have been engaged with Bangladeshi social media since 2006. The, I have interviewed the main actors. I have took photos. Uh, I've been in the scene, uh, survived many of the uh, attacks uh, as such. Uh, I have been the blogger, blogger moderator. Uh, online activist, online and activist in Shahbag movement and social media researcher. So what I try to came up is one of, try to give an analytical framework at the same time, try to analyze many Shahbags as, as much as I can and the post Shahbag um, stories. So in 5th February, as you can know that uh, members of Boan, Blogger and Online Activist Network, created a Facebook event protesting the verdict of ICT, International War Crime Tribunal, that was also mentioned in the previous uh, section, uh, to call a convicted war criminal of Liberation War of 1971. So Bomaon members are online-based urban youth, mainly 22 to 45, mostly university educated. So immediately after the Facebook event, vigorous debate, discussion, and engagement was observed among the social media users of Bangladesh. Same day, Bon organized a protest rally in the street of Shahabag, in which around 150 people from diverse background have participated. I'm, I was one of them. Later, it developed into a social movement demanding capital punishment of war criminal criminals, which continued from 5th February to 5th March 2013 by occupying 
the urban traffic hub of Shahabad. So my argument is neither the technology by itself, social media alone, nor the socioeconomic historical condition can be sole reason for this kind of movement. There is a dynamic dialectic relationship between the social media and the society. Sociality, this concept, we should be very clear that should be conceptualized as a dynamic relational matrix within which subjects are constantly interacting in ways that are co-productive, continually plastic, malleable, and at the same time, in many situations, become strong. As uh, our, my previous speaker already said, that the intensity um, grows and then it dissolves as well. So we need to see this malleable context as well. So compared to traditional media, social media made serious changes. Uh, communication process radically by introducing web to technology, help creating digital sociality in which roles sociality becomes integrated. It also provides integrated and converging surveillance, social media as such. So in one particular platform, we are here about 70 people from diverse geographical location, but now this intensity, this conference by itself showing our intensity of participating of this process. It would have been possible without the use of web to technology. So it is transformative, globally local, online to offline, offline to online, public to private, private to private public as well. So resistance, how I conceptualize, is an action and non-action of people. We may recognize it instantly whenever we see it. It operates among massive crowd protesting in the street, one of my example, and also to everyday nuances, daily activities, personal level to the level of the collective. It is not unambiguous binary understanding of domination versus resistance. It is not centralized power or resistance. It is ambiguous. But the Ortner argued resistance losing this ambiguity due to the work of Foucault, which focused on less entrenched, more pervasive, everyday forms of power. And Scott focused on the inescapable, less organized, everyday forms of resistance. So Castus argued that the seed of resistance operates primarily in the private sphere in an autonomous domain where the actors may feel autonomous. So that was the space that was given by the blogosphere, then the early social media. But now when we are informed, we know that we are not so autonomous anymore. So what is the journey? So Abu Lugut proposed that resistance is not outward or in antagonism to power, but in Shabak movement, it was but a rather a diagnostic of it. So in my presentation, I tried to diagnose as well. In the line of focus argument, suggests that power rather than solely oppressive or negative, a productive uh, of all kinds of practice, subjectivity and knowledge, and it dispersed through the spheres of life. Saying where there is a power, there is resistance. Abu Lugut suggested where there is a resistance, there is power. So digital resistance, uh, which translates into a social movement, is transcending spaces, generated sociality online and offline. The dynamic relationship between technology and society in such an event requires a theoretical framework. So that is I'm trying to give through resistance sociality. So Papa Charisi pointed out that social media is help generating affective publics. So uh, that part is very true from Netrapa, is that affective publics, emotional contagion is there. And social media encourages effective attainment, support effective investment, and propagate effectively charged expression. In that note, I have created this analytical framework of resistance sociality, uh, mainly generated through social media, which is connective action, connective leadership, uh, frontline activism in the street, uh, virtual cosmopolitan group, Boan, social media political efficacy. Can we use it? to mobilize political movement. Yes, selectivism, those who are not really engaged, they felt like they might have the power to change, do something. It creates intensity, even for a brief moment of time or a longer moment of time, it creates intensity, it creates contextual fellowship. Thus, uh, what are my method? Uh, in the case of studying social movements, which is, Thousands, tens of thousands of people gathered in a particular geographical space, Shahbag, uh, intensified in social media space, Facebook, blog, YouTube, um, Twitter, everywhere, and then dispersed um, after a while, right? Quite a complex phenomena. 
So one month, very much engaged and then dispersed. How to study that? So for that, I have used blended mode of ethnography, exploring a given phenomena, actual form of blending varies. And it is multimodal and not only multimodal, uh, it is multi-sided as well. Online space, offline space. Multimodal because face-to-face -face interaction, uh, SMS interaction, other online space interaction, comment box there, multi-sided, physical, local, either in advance, you can see when you interview those people who are involved or you are in that physical space when they are having digital activism as such. So on the left, there is a tribunal, a call of tribunal that protesting that Shahbag, uh, the tribe, ICT tribunal have could have an entity with the Aumilik government who was propagating that um, their main sole reason is to give punishment to the war criminals. So many of the cases, the recent interpretation often says that uh, this was not against government. This was not against ICT. Hmm. But the truth is it was uh, against government. It was <laughs> against ICT, the verdict of ICT. So my uh, journey is this is 150 people standing there. Then those people being creative think of, let's go to Shahabag and come back to uh, Raju Bhaskarju. Often the protester in front of Shahabag uh, make this routine. However, that day, some of us decided to occupy the physical space of Shahabag intersection. And this occupation hmm, made another statement uh, to the authority as such that this might be serious, right? So goes on this participation and uh, moving on this part, uh, how this contested public sphere actually emerged. If you look at that, that in the offline and online space, state economy, contested fluid pub public sphere, connecting with socio-political economy, socio-economic sphere, socio-cultural sphere, and the life world or the cultural private sphere. We start with cognition, we start with communication, and then we cooperate and we also fight with each other, right? So if we take the case of Boan, not all of the members are Boan. If they are supporter of this ideology, supporters of this issue, they could connect, they could easily make networks, right? That's why people often call it as native netizens. But state intervention is both in the offline space and both in the online space, right? In the right, if you say, state in many different roles, economy in many different roles are prevailing. Thus, the physical space has its meaning, the historicity of protesting in front of uh, National Museum, the Shahabad, has its meaning. Hmm. So this historicity is not, we should count that. At the same time, the historicity of protesting through social media, we need to connect that as well, or from 2006 at least. So from there to there, and then there to there, how things are moving. So 5th February, 2013 night, from the top shot, you can see occupied Shahabag. 6th February, people are still coming. 8th February, this is a sea of people, right? So how these things are happening and what is the meaning that it creates? What is the aftermath? If you go for resistance sociality, frontline activism and contextual fellowship, many of my narratives says, I didn't know this person. I didn't know about these issues. But the, I see young people who are honest, fighting for justice. And this justice is not only the national narrative. This justice, sense of justice, have their many multiple meanings, but often over overshadowed by the dominant narratives. That is the game of the politics. Not all of them are, uh, there are many volunteers. They are coming from a narrative says who have other political um, affiliation, but this felt like this is the place to have this uh, justice regained. So we often, from now, uh, from today's perspective, we often forget this justice point of view because, because this centralized part of Gono Jagaran Moncho. So what is Gono Jagaran Moncho? 
if we uh, forget about the later development of Ganojagar Mancho, Ganojagar Mancho as a platform gives us a potential of a third alternative political entity, hmm, which is fluid in nature, has the power to negotiate with the state. Many ministers are there uh, creating demands. They are, um, there are others of this center point. Who are the others? anti shahabag media, war criminals, Jama, to some extent, Aumili Gassat, uh, civil societies, leftist political parties. See, all uh, in a quasi open space, it is bringing in people. However, when the trust loses that Ganojagar Moncho uh, dispersed, right? The resistance uh, integrity dispersed. Hmm. So on that note, 2000 Shahbag movement clearly showed social media is a political public sphere. Outside of partisan politics, it may generate political entities. Social media movement has huge potential for replicability. You don't need only the other leaders. You can be your leader. So 2018 quota reform or movement that is started from 2013, 2016 version. The road safety movement of 2018, Netra Paja said, 2021 road safety movement version two. But is Shahabag over? No, the contestation and negotiation persist in public discourses. The contestation of the narratives remains. Thus, mainstream politics and institution want this hybrid space to be contained. So that is beyond Shahabak section. So how they will do that? State colonizes the space as much as possible. And what are the spaces? Both online and offline spaces. Suppressive implication, implications, uh, repressive ICT laws, post Shahabak ICT laws, if you see, the first one is 2006, then the amendment is 2013, then 2016, the ICT laws are becoming more suppressive, more suppressive, more suppressive. The examples they are creating in, um, of this uh, law is much more violent and violent and violent. Surveillance equipment, uh, huge investment in buying equipment, restriction in using physical spaces, a protest should be there, protest shouldn't be there. Information leakages, the recent one, phone conversation, videos, photos becomes a norm, right? Every once in a while you see that this phone, phone conversation has been leaked. So institutional regulation is strict protocol for institutional behavior, uh, traditional media control, even more controlled. So collaborating with global social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, PR surveillance, uh, hyper celebration of state sponsored narratives through social media, subjugating the critical discourses, setting up examples, creating a circle of fear, culture of fear, propaganda, diversion, deviation, pet social media opinion leaders. Misinformation, disinformation, no law for privacy protection of the users, many more strategies, right? So is it new? Not so new. If you go back uh, and can remember the biggest populist support that Shahbag was able to acquire was divided by the propagation of Bashar Kella, that time anti Shahbag um, uh, digital space saying that this guy, Rajiv Haidar Chowdhury is an atheist and uh, the legitimacy of his killing is thus proven. And that's how the whole mass uh, support has been divided. The, in the polymedia environment, Amar Desh was uh, propagating that, yes, these are the most violent people. So the discussion we had in the previous session, making heroes, and now <laughs> bloggers from the first half were the new heroes, and then now the current narr narration, they became the villains, right? So the Morning. making, and, yeah, Sorry how much? Interrupt. Can I give you, you do you have just the one minute to wrap up? Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Sure, 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 sure. So these are the uh, pro propagation version that is still continuing in different formation. Uh, this is still continuing uh, uh, defamation. This is uh, making false doctorate uh, imagery still producing, but the victim, those who are protesting against each other, 
they are both contained by the same mechanism. For, uh, in the front is the quote unquote atheist bloggers and down the uh, pro Islamist um, Hefazuti blogger. Thus, the social media space became the last one. Uh, physical space has been changed. There is no more Chobir Hart. Shahbag becomes a television station and increased surveillance. So is resistance over? No. However, the mechanism of containing the resistance is highly sophisticated, ever evolving, proving my thesis again, it is a dynamic um, dialectic relationship between technology and society. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I would conclude here. Thank you. Superb. Thank you, Moin, for a really wonderful paper. And there's plenty of questions to ask around not only digital activism, but digital security and surveillance. We'll come to that later. But um, let us move to now our final speaker of the day, um, Taslima Akta, who is a Bangladeshi activist and Photographer, she is a graduate of Dhaka University as well as the photography school Bachala. She is a member of the women's organization Biplavinari Shongoti and the leftist activist group Gono Shongoti Andalon. She's also the president of the Bangladesh Garment Garments Shramik um, Shongoti, uh, the Bangladesh Garment Workers Union. In addition, she teaches at Bachala. Over to you, Taslima. I hello everybody. Great, wonderful. Thank you all. I'm very happy to see all of you, especially side by uh, Nasreen, Anna, like me, and especially uh, when I see Samina Lutfa, it's really inspiring for me. I think uh, all of you will be agreed with me. Uh, it is very difficult for us. Uh, when as an activist uh, and people like us who work as a volunteer, it's difficult to sometimes make time to respond in proper time and make presentation and many other things because you know that uh, in Bangladesh, we have to do many things in single hand. So I, I will try to share a few of my experience. Um, Uh, I will talk about the workers' uh, rights under the needle of development. Uh, the results of development and democracy are booming around us and all times as Bangladesh marked its 15th anniversary of independence. In the metropolitan city, everything moves at a breakneck pace. Large high-rise buildings, roads, metro rails, and construction sites all are visible. Million dollar clothes have started to fly from Bangladesh to market of West and Europe on a daily basis. Each of the these roads, clothes, dwelling, as well as other things, has been made to look alive through the way they act and react. Today, I will focus on garments worker struggles, challenges, and movements in these times of 15 years of independence of our country. How much progress has been made are MG workers who toil down to dust for this claimed development. Four million RMG workers earn 83% export income each year, but they get only $93 as minimum wage. They made this sector near about $40 billion sector. How is their life, their movement, challenges they are facing? When we are talking about the 15th years of independence and the RMG sector, usually we will see so-called success story of economy through the mainstream daily, mainstream media, mainstream scholar, NGOs, and of course, by the entrepreneurs. They will always let you know more about the success of economy, success of workers' life. They will tell you about the new labor force, 
the new women, about the new women who are working uh, in this sector, maybe you will find some true information from their story success uh, and their uh, story about the success, but they will uh, never tell you the other part of the coin. They will not tell you how workers sacrificing their uh, life, their youth, their nutrition for the well-being of owner, buyer, for the government, and for the so-called development. I want to share a few stories through which you can understand the recent condition of those young workers' life and struggle who make us renowned to the whole world. They stitch t-shirts, stitch made in Bangladesh logo, uh, for international consumer, with the whole process, they become the part of globalization. Now I tell you about Rohimia. Rohimia is a false name of our garment workers because I cannot uh, express you his real name. Um, he uh, is working in a factory that uh, at Mirpur in the capital city of Dhaka. Uh, last few days ago, he was highly tortured and injured by the ruling party student being Chhatra League who were wearing a helmet. That time, police also took part of action to dismantle the protest and tortured workers. What were workers or Rohimia's fault? What were police doing that time? And where was the workers' organization? The fault of Rohimia is that he was following his fellow workers' protest. His fellow workers were raising demand for increasing attendance bonus from 300 taka to 500 taka. And, other, and they raised other uh, factory-based demand. In this time of price hike of oil and other daily product, transport costs, workers are feeling hopeless with the amount of very poor wage, $93 near about, and other facilities. When I met Rohimia, I felt that he should stay at hospital because he was injured severely, but he was at home. He forced to stay home after getting only um, first aid um, that he didn't deserve. He was trying to say, um, and I saw, he was trying to asking us and requesting us not to do any protests for him. Uh, he was not uh, uh, talking, but he, he was expressing by his hand and uh, other uh, movement. And I saw fear in his eyes. With full of fear in his eyes, he wanted to request us not to organize any protest uh, against owner or factory. The protest started with spontaneity. But when workers' organization and workers' leader tried to enter the movement, that time police and local goon and Chhatra League dismantled the protest and spread fear within the workers and within the area. Factory administration shut down the factory for two days and workers had been fallen in the same fear and threat of losing job uh, from factory and they were so afraid and um, factory owners gave as usual some false promises and uh, after that the workers started uh, working inside the factory again. That time we again saw our owners are looking, uh, uh, looking for the old conspiracy story behind the protest. They were looking for the workers organizer and they filed hundreds of cases against workers and they are trying to arrest workers and they are looking for workers leader, they are harassing workers leaders. And all with, with this small story, I think you can understand uh, what is the condition of worker and their movement. And I can tell you more stories, but uh, I, I, I don't want to um, tell more, but maybe a few things. I can tell you more stro stories through which you can understand the situation of movements and condition, but now I just want to mention few words about some 
more phenomenons of workers' life and struggle. Few months ago, Kanchan Mia, another RMG worker, shot by police in a protest where workers were demanding for increasing the days of festival leave. Kanchan Mia is still in hospital for uh, many, uh, like uh, six months and struggling with life and death. I can tell you another worker story. Uh, her name is Rupali, who bound to arrange child marriage for her 13 years daughter in Corona period. Many workers lost job in this time. In Corona period, they faced termination, layoff, cutting wages, and many other things. But that time, they didn't get their wage properly. After all, they were in movement and protest. When COVID entered our country, that time, our young workers, they hadn't get any scope to stay home, maintain social distancing, because all this social distancing, all these rules, regulation is uh, like a luxury for them. Uh, we saw all the time they bound to uh, go on street and organize protest for, and they were uh, very, um, what I can say, they, they were bound to organize protest uh, to save their livelihood. We have seen the same experience after structural killing of Rana Plaza and Tasreen. That time also workers, they hadn't get any scope to or think about their beloved family person uh, who died under the rubble or who lost their limb or who were highly injured. They were moved from one place to one, another place, place to find their uh, missing beloved person or fellow workers. And um, they were moving from uh, uh, school to police station, to hospital, to another place. Um, uh, for sometimes for their uh, family members, sometimes for justice, sometimes for compensation. And that time we organized protests for justice and compensation. Rana Plaza got attention from the whole world. International consumer, reader, all were looking at Bangladesh that time. But after Rana Plaza experience, we thought that our workers organization or um, our workers, they will get um, more access to organize themselves and they will get their rights than before, but uh, uh, they didn't. And uh, after that, um, uh, we had some experience uh, from wage movement uh, in 2016, 17. That time we saw the same thing that uh, the workers and workers organization who, who were organizing uh, the wage movement, they were tortured. Uh, owner uh, and government filed um, thousands of uh, cases against them, and um, and and there are many problems still um, uh, moving around the workers' area and within the workers' organization. They are not getting proper wage compensation, safety, and they are facing new challenges of automation also. Workers' movement is highly polluted by mainstream politics and owner. They want to buy workers, leaders. They want to buy union. They want to maintain paid yellow organization and leader. Uh, maybe all of you can remember that uh, after Rana Plaza, the owners association, BGME, they organized a uh, summit uh, that the name was Dhaka summit as far I remember and they declared a dream of uh, 15 billion dollar sector within the 15th uh, anniversary of Bangladesh and they are very close to that dream but our workers and workers movement is not stepping in the same development stair. Our political situation, lack of workers right, lack of democracy, corruption, national election situation, all are related with workers' movement and workers' life and struggle. So I think it uh, will be a wishful thinking if we think that a strong workers' movement will be arise in this political uh, environment. Um, but uh, we are, of course, uh, hopeful about workers' movement. Many 
when we see every day the workers, uh, the young workers who are going to the factory, um, we feel inspired and uh, many organizations also try, trying to organize themselves with all these uh, bad condition of political situation and other things. We feel inspiration when we see the young workers are in protest. Maybe we, we, will, uh, we, we don't see the middle class uh, uh, when uh, there is um, a separation from state. We don't see that much uh, middle class uh, on street for protest, but uh, our workers uh, and workers organization, they don't have any alternative without making movement and struggle. And because hunger and the state of real life can't stop them from struggle. They have only way to fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasneema, for that great presentation. I'm really delighted by just the caliber of papers um, in this panel. I'm going to ask the audience, just so that I don't get to speak too much, that you know, you come you come in and you take over. And I can already see hands going up. So I will, I do have questions, but I'm going to save it and hand it over to the audience. So I'm going to go to Feroz Alam first to ask um, his questions. I'm going to, Feroz, you can ask your question now. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I, I heard uh, three presentations, uh, Dr. Moin Zalal Jodhuri, uh, Samia Lutpa, and uh, uh, Taslima's presentation, wonderful presentation. Um, my, my research is about disinformation and uh, social media. So my concern is that uh, disinformation propaganda has been an integral part of maintaining colonial interest and expanding imperial domination around the world. Under digital capitalism, we see whenever there is a resistance against oppression, the political power always says it's a conspiracy theory, it's a lie. So we are now trying to combat computational propaganda through a global digital infrastructure that follows the same capitalist logic of surplus creation. So in situation like this, how are we imagine a resistance uh, with people who do not have sufficient resources or you know, uh, capacity to uh, resist against this surveillance capitalism or digital domination? Um, what I'll do is I'll go over sort of, um, I'm, was your question directed at one person for us or was it? directed at everyone within the... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want, I think it was more directed to Dr. Moeen and uh, Samia. Okay, great. So um, we'll sort of, if you can just remember those that question, Moeen and Samina, and I will move now to Nayanika to ask her question. Um, hi, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, uh, maybe my question kind of is similar. Um, to um, Dr. Chaudhuri as well. Charlotte, great to see you here. Um, uh, just to ask if, if, you know, looking at the various ways in which um, digital surveillance is taking over and it's if it's there everywhere, what are the possibilities? So it's a simple question. What are the possibilities of resistance, of, particularly in the case of Bangladesh? If, if it's everywhere in the way you've shown and it's kind of intricately uh, it, do we all go offline uh, to, uh, you know, do we all have our little phones, which, you know, uh, instead of our smartphones? So what, what are the possibilities of then resistance while also being also digitally connected and we all are? Um, so that is um, one question I had for you. And also uh, a question for, um, for um, uh, Lima. Um, really nice to see you, um, Taslima. Um, I was thinking also of, um, I've just received a T-shirt from Renuma, um, a Made in Bangladesh T-shirt for one of my boys. And so, you know, the one which has a brand on the top, it's written on top. It's no more hidden um, in the label. And that is a kind of political step as well. It's not just to say it is made in Bangladesh. Um, I was also thinking about, it does, given the kind of conditions of, uh, of the workers and the way the, the state is also hand in glove with, the in uh, the 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 garments uh, um, industry itself. Um, I was also thinking of the role of arts within it. So I'm obviously thinking about the film made in Bangladesh or any other aspects in which the 
artistic sphere is trying to bring out the issues uh, related to the garment workers. Does that help at all uh, to the to the social movement you are uh, putting forth, or does it does it take the tension away? Um, um, is what I wanted to ask. Okay, um, great. Thanks, Nayanika. I'll just ask the last question before we let, um, let in the presenters. And okay, so this is from Ali Askardara. Hi, Nitra. Um, on your point of language, fluid movement building, and the media scrutiny against the non elite student protesters, can you expand more on this realm of how public intellectuals like Shahid al Alam have emerged in the international non profit? activism seen as the rescue of the movement? And what's your observation on this um, cultural capital building um, of public figures and how that has impacted the future of non-elite um, led student protests such as Nirapod Sharok um, Andalon? Thank you. So if you, who wants to go first? Do, do you want me to go first or? Sure. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I'll, I'll respond later. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, first try to answer uh, Tara's question. Uh, she also direct messaged me um, about how um, this is a uh, kind of like a project that is where uh, he is a risker. I don't know about that very well. Uh, but what I see in, in Bangladesh is like in these uh, three years uh, from 2018 till today, we haven't seen any cases being filed against the people who attacked the journalists uh, on the streets of Dhaka on broad daylight. And most of the attackers, many of the attackers could actually be identified from the photos that were actually taken. Uh, and no, no, no cases were filed against those perpetrators. We have seen that um, actors, uh, teachers, uh, people like Shohid Dulalam, as well as students from different universities and colleges, uh, they had um, had to go through these legal processes. They had to go to jail, and they had they were all arrested. And these uh, Shohid Dulalam's case, for example, has not yet ended. Uh, so there's another date for it. I, we know that in the next month, probably. So what happens here is uh, you see people who have been violated, uh, they haven't got justice. Be uh, the road safety measures have not been uh, in place. And uh, the students had to come up again for the phase two uh, in November uh, when the Notre Dame student and another um, uh, journalist uh, was killed by the dump trucks. And now what happens is, um, we see that uh, there is the government is very heavy handed and it um, uh, quells any resistance, any protests. Uh, it's not only in Bangladesh, as uh, uh, rightly pointed out by Firuz Alam, that it's uh, global uh, and it's um, uh, very much uh, uh, to do with the digital surveillance and the uh, tools that they already have. Uh, but we haven't seen people who were uh, violated against to have justice. We haven't seen justice on the roads that the students were first trying to um, uh, uh, protest against. Uh, also, we haven't seen uh, the uh, uh, Asian Energy Corporation war or global coal management uh, to be completely out of uh, business. So these things didn't happen. Um, meanwhile, um, activists like Shoydul Alam or Tasim Akhtar or maybe you and me, uh, we do gain capital, uh, social capital because we do these things all the time. So um, how do you interpret that when um, uh, in the uh, context of this whole um, political situation where any dissent um, uh, can be uh, squashed uh, uh, very harshly, uh, where uh, I don't see um, I actually don't see the relevance of looking at uh, this um, uh, movement from that angle. And of course, the fact that um, XYZ will, uh, whoever is in the activism scene, will definitely gain um, social capital and cultural capital with every single movement that he or she participates in. Uh, so that's a so sort of a given. Uh, to um, uh, respond to uh, Firoz Alam's question about surveillance or uh, of course, to so um, whether we go offline. Uh, uh, we cannot go behind in terms of the fact that we are using uh, technology now, but there is no 
as an activist myself, um, there is no uh, other option but to create person-to-person -person connection whenever you want to do any sort of activism anywhere in the world. So this is something that um, has, it has to be very cultural. It has to be um, uh, very uh, individual to individual as well as a collective um, uh, sort of identity that we need to build. So this is something that uh, cross cuts your class, your gender, your sexuality, and other identifying uh, you know, categories that uh, separate us from each other. So this has to be uh, very intersectional and interpersonal. Uh, if, although we use technology um, and we are part of this whole surveillance, definitely there is no other way but to um, do things uh, personally, face-to-face. -face. Uh, I think that was all, right? Did I, did I miss someone's question? I think that was good. We can now go over to either Taslima or Moin. Okay. Moin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for wonderful questions, uh, Nainika and Firoz. I will start from the startup. Uh, is that I was really, really depressed doing my PhD. Uh, dealing with the same questions that you have asked, really, and also kind of uh, uh, kind of matrix effect was there as well, Bordu, Foucault, and everything. However, however, uh, even if we contest the idea of agency, people's agency, I would say that my experience as an activist in the on offline space. Hmm, taught me that um, that's why I, I took that ground up approach that power I would go with with all due respect with all the structuralists hmm, is that it is generative. Hmm. I will strongly uh, with all this um, the um, what can I say store or maybe the percentage is high, high the authoritative regime and their technology is super efficient However, at the same time, because the moment we see solidarity, the moment we see solidarity, I, I, I really can bow for that, that even with all online digital sociality, people need, I, I, that is proven in the street, people need physical interaction. That has been proven over again in the case of uh, COVID separation. Hmm. So physical uh, assimilation and then uh, some in the first point that this network of people, because social media mm -hmm. is now used as the tool of uh, not only uh, dismantling a particular discourse, but also human interaction and the probability of any collective action or a guided collective, collective action. Become the new liberal agent, you are the buyer, you should do that. But there are some other ways of hope. People are coming with uh, open source uh, softwares. People are interacting, in my experience in 2014, when I visit um, Germany, then I had an interview with a NATO guy and they mentioned, he mentioned that, uh, you know how we made decisions? How? Because <laughs> they are one of the surveillors. How, how, how you do do that? So. We put all our equipments at least two kilometers away. Uh, and then we go to a, uh, I think, 10 inch wall, hmm, top down with only paper and pencil and the lighter. And we discuss, make our decision. Mm, uh, and then we burn it out. True fact. But one of the key factor is there, people is will coming up. Uh, if, if you can see ER key, if you can see fact watch, if you can see that very local, localized version, and if you see the uh, common discourse, uh, they are not, many of the um, participants are not really uh, attacking directly, all right? Through their text narr narration in the Facebook status, they are using um, satires. So last three years or four years, the use of satires uh, through social media increased and people really can connect now. Okay, that means that, okay. Hmm. So that is the narration. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so digital capital, capitalism is invading, no doubt. It is coming to wristwatch, then going to microchip, no doubt. All right. 
at the same time, people are also negotiating as a, not only as an activist, but as a researcher, do not forget about that. That is one of the learning I have had is that for the human cognition of how to interact and how to make her world or our world, uh, the, the, the need for, it's a really deep question, is that the need for human interaction really pervades still now. Okay, are, are those contestating? Yes. Uh, is the economy is prevailing? Yes, there is a Facebook office right now. Uh, neoliberal economy will push it. Digital capitalism will push it to the extent. Yes, those who are not yet um, know this critical aspect, uh, would they be fall victim quite easily? Yes, there is a possibility. However, the same thing, if you start from the very beginning, those who didn't know how to blog, who taught them? People other person go and taught them that come on this thing is interesting come <laughs> and and uh, and then uh, privacy within a quasi privacy setting if you go to many facebook for its business it needs huge data firoz knows is better than me at the same time uh, it also creates the option of uh, private spaces why even it is false or quasi they feel the need of this privacy. Okay, 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 okay. Huh. Uh, WhatsApp is yours. Hmm. Now Meta Metaverse is coming. So uh, I would, I really see, I, I really tell that maybe the answers is uh, not maybe all the time coming from this, uh, the North, maybe the South is giving the answer. The answer is uh, being very much, uh, really cultivating our social relations really cultivating much more consciously, hmm, uh, be very privacy aware, put our devices away, that becomes an activism, put our devices away. Hmm. Uh, every day uh, we are going to meet in the physical spaces, in the social protest, one liner, we will meet there. And then the forgetfulness that has been generated, look at yourself and ask that before five or 10 years ago, how many phone numbers can you remember? Many. But now the typo, my English writing gone down because of autocorrect, everything automation, right? So this is, I think the sense of resistance, I still not only believe, I think that there are many other ways people when they're facing challenges, how about this, uh, the, the, the repli replicability that was used by the who, um, not Notre Dame College case, right? Two students died. Uh, one student died and the protest came up then uh, and then the teacher is coming up the teacher is coming up before many teachers was sacked because of some status in facebook but even though student teachers are coming up one key point i would say that no matter how strong how brilliant the um, mechanism is uh, people are learning not only the system is learning people are also learning everyday interactions, people are actually learning. Maybe the process is difficult. Maybe they are, it was used to become an automated process to take a photograph, then say, no photograph, thank you. Hmm. Or even uses this photograph in a particular platform. Hmm. People will invest in say the cyberpunk's ideas of 2000, uh, 1980s hmm, that, oh, okay, uh -huh. uh, sorry, one second. So uh, uh, yeah, so we will be, I think uh, we, I, I'm still very hopeful that we can deal with, we'll use technology for ourselves as such. But thank you so much. A bit a philosophical answer, but yeah, <laughs> that is so far. Now over to Lima. Uh, thank you, Nain Padi, for asking your question. Um, I think there is no doubt, and maybe all of we will be agreed that uh, the main weapon of struggle is finally to organize people. Uh, against oppression, against the global political economy. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we need to think uh, about our state of mind, which is highly gripped by the mainstream cultural activity. Uh, for that reason, I think uh, we need different kind of activism and we need the connection and bridging with each other activity. Uh, you were talking about uh, the artwork and other cultural activity. I think this is very important because when Rana Plaza happened, we had uh, experienced uh, these things. There's many activists, they work together, uh, they organized drama, they uh, wrote poem. 
uh, they make documentary film on government, on Rana Plaza, and on issue of workers' rights. Um, and these things, I think, and uh, many photographers also to, uh, took a photo for documenting the history as a witness. So all these things, I think, very important to make our mind set up because we are um, highly uh, gripped by the ideological apparatus of mainstream. So most of the people and usually the middle class, uh, they think like the owner. They think that, yes, the workers, they are de demanding more. Uh, they have to be satisfied within $93. So they don't know about the life, the satisfaction, uh, the dream of a person who is a worker, but a citizen, but a human being. So to feel it, to think about the story behind the uh, T-shirt and uh, to think what is the relation be between another citizen with the workers, with the consumers, we need to make bridge with other cultural activity. I think this is very important. Thank you, Nanika. Sorry, I was muted. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, do raise your hand um, if you do. If not, I will take the opportunity to ask my question. Um, this is, I mean, I'll ask Nitra first and then, and it was really, I mean, I think what was interesting about it is just, I mean, you see the fractures in, in that sort of repressive state where you're telling me a way where you're showing that repression doesn't actually work it's in in fact it's a more generative um it's more generative for solidarity and it's more generative in terms of sort of encouraging um uh, the protests to continue at what point does repression work um and i was just at what point does a sort of a protest break down and um yeah at what point does repression work that's really my question for you Nidra. i see two more hands are yeah, these for we, me or i well let's take those so that you're not the only one having to answer the question so i'll turn around and i'll go to nasreen because she's unmuted but um i'll go to shruti next uh, okay, I'll be very quick because I thought no one is asking, so I would I was I wanted to take a chance, but then other people are uh, also asking questions. I just wanted to ask a small question with to Sharot Moin, uh, Doctor uh, Moin. Um, you say that is like the resistance, uh, especially in, in your answer, the resistance, and it's not only about uh, people who are uh, resisting or uh, uh, the workers, even as a researcher. That's also a part of it. So I, my question is basically, as a participant of Shabak protest, and you know, I was also be there. I was there. Like we all kind of there in a different way. So how would you uh, situate yourself in that whole scenario, and how would you uh, reconcile the uh, di the different uh, that uh, role that we constantly takes as a researcher and as an activist, and how? How would you um, negotiate your yourself within that? Great, thank you. And over to Shruti. Hi. Um, it was love. I mean, the lovely presentations. Uh, needless to say, uh, but there's something that I I because I've been writing on this set different movements for quite some time from Shabak to. Um, uh, the road safety movement and anti bad protest um, in in different forums. One of the things that I I think what Nanika was trying to say, and I I think I I have the same question as well. Uh, the specific specificity of this movements that this because we are we're looking into a broad trope uh 50 years of movement as well it's not only 50 years of Bangladesh but the recent movement and how their lineage right and why these movements are unique and need to be discussed in a particular way um and I think uh, in my last piece uh, for uh for anthropological uh, uh hotspot I actually talked about uh shift in the political field. Um, I think 
unless and people we talk about the shift in the political field, uh, the nature of populist movement that is happening or the transversal movement that we uh, see, the, the, the shift in ideological led movement and transversal movement and um, the interaction and the exchange in different forms, um, uh, the reason behind those. Uh, I think those are the, those are the few things that um, I, I, I was expecting, especially from Nitra to talk about that, that because uh, she actually, in, in earlier work for um, full body movement, she, she actually used the Bourdieu's framework and one of the, one of the idea and the frame um, that would you use is, is about the political field right uh, the f uh, and and who occupies and how like then it's not only the state but we see different actors um, and and their amalgamation their their occupation their um, maneuvering um, their different forms of capital so that is something that I I mean, these are really interesting commentary, but th that is something that I would be curious um, to know from Nitra and from um, uh, Sharad as well, because uh, Limapa's work I kind of know, um, but I think the shift in the field is something that we really need to address as well. So it was a question, but my, I mean like how they would use that because um, I know that both uh, uh, Sharad and, and Nitra they use the Bodian framework, right? So it, it doesn't have to be Bodian framework, but the things like the nature of the movement um, has has changed. And that is the specificity of our time, uh, the, the kind of movement that we see, uh, whether it's online or offline. Um, and, and there's a, I think that there's a broader undercurrent that is that, is, uh, that kind of um, contour this movement as well. And what are those? Uh, that is something that 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 would be interesting to know from all of you. Okay, so we'll take our last question, which comes again from Feroz. Um, I'm sorry. If he, it, if he could keep it brief, that would be great. Yeah, so that, no. um, I'll keep it very brief. I wanted to know if attention is a commodity, and with attention we develop resistance. Under digital capitalism, when we are constantly colonizing, and I use it very advisedly, digital colonization of human consciousness. How are we to build resistance? Was that to a particular person or to everyone? <laughs> General. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just leave it to whoever wants to take that question, but um, who would like to start? Shall we go to Lima? Is there a question for you, Lima? I think there was. Or we can go to you, Nidra. I think there were plenty of questions for you. So, uh, yeah, I have all the questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first one uh, is from Lily, which is when does um, resistance work? It does work uh, to quell, uh, when, when does, sorry, repression works? Um, scholars have shown that uh, the more non-democratic the space is, the more likely it is that the repression would work because people would uh, be uh, very scared. They will, they will be afraid to go back for follow-up protests, uh, especially when there is a, um, a military uh, is in the sort of um, a scene. Uh, things like that uh, would definitely um, uh, make repression work. Um, However, in uh, my cases, the two cases that I, I uh, talked about today, uh, the first case will very being a, a, a almost successful movement where uh, repression actually didn't work. That was my basic point. Uh, but in case of the Nirapod Shorok Angolon, uh, it's not that it didn't work. Um, uh, I think it worked at the later end, uh, almost at the, at the later part of the of the movement. In the very beginning, it didn't work. It uh, incited more protests and uh, kind of uh, worked the same way as the full body movement. And however, the later part, when the arrests started to happen, uh, and the media was portraying them as villains, then it kind of uh, 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 saw the uh, end of the movement, phase one. Um, so I think it definitely has to do a lot about how democratic is this political space where we are um, actually uh, maneuvering this um, 
these movements and resistances. Uh, to uh, go back to Shilte's question, uh, it's actually really broad. Um, in this specific uh, paper, I wanted to look only uh, at the um, at the impact of repression on follow-up protests. So I definitely didn't go into uh, the discussion of the field that I do for uh, how the, uh, resistance is always a dialogic process and um, how political fields and the shift in it and um, popular um, uh, movements can actually um, play a part in creating new fields. Uh, I didn't talk about those, but this is because I only had a little time uh, to discuss about such a huge move and it was a mistake to take both of them. I, could, I should have just talked about one. Uh, anyways, yes, I definitely agree with you, Shruti, that uh, it is, um, it ha we have to bring into the discussion of the broader um, uh, uh, structural issues that are there, different sorts of actors, different sorts of capital, obviously, uh, uh, but uh, hopefully it will be in another paper and not this one. But thank you for the feedback. To answer Firoz Alam's question, I'm not sure how to answer that <laughs> because uh, if I um, if I understood the question, uh, it was about how do we resist anything given the situation that we are being surveilled uh, in the digital space, right? Um, still, people are doing things, so I guess uh, you. Um, in every era, there were new things that uh, protesters had to face um, because uh, the, uh, it's not only uh, that the protesters are changing their tactics, it's the other way around as well. I just said that it's a dialogic process. Uh, when, for example, in Fulbury, uh, they uh, started out with like 6,500 hectares of land, but then when protesters were really uh, adamant of not giving up even one hectare, they actually toned it down and they got uh, the project down to 5,000 hectares. So this is something that, and there are so many other things that they had to take down. So uh, it's always a dialogic process. It's the protesters are doing things and then uh, the, owners, uh, for example, in case of Rana Plaza or the, uh, the apparel sector, the owners or maybe the, the company or the government, they will do something else. So this is a dialogic process and it always goes on and on and on and on. And uh, framing, counter framing, this is how the movement meaning is made. And this is how from one movement to another it changes, but it actually doesn't change to a whole different set of things, but just a little bit of incremental change. I think these, um, uh, Given the situation of the digital world, um, still we are kind of, we have space to negotiate and go on with uh, different sorts of um, ways to protest. I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you, Nidra. And if we could go to Moin. To yep. Yeah. Mm, yep. Mm, thank you so much. I'll start with uh, Nasrimal's question uh, because she was part of that, saw that journey as well. How did I negotiate it? I think uh, the negotiation process still continues, to be very honest. Uh, one of the feature is like, when I was in the role of activist, the other was very clear. And uh, the threat was also very imminent. Hmm. That somebody is coming, bashing out, uh, we have to fight it out. However, when uh, the inside of Shahabag is complex, there are many sense of not heroism uh, selling out. There are many incidents of negotiation. There are many incidents of betrayal. There are many incidents of uh, pushing towards. There are many sense of uh, subjective inclination. There are many sense of becoming the hero and then uh, all other narratives are gone, right? So uh, for me, uh, going to Japan and getting the PhD was one of the escapes and also negotiating with the whole process as such. During that period, uh, one of the groups that I'm quite affiliated with was um, bloggers and online activists and the killing, brutal murder um, and vicious, visually uh, serious killing uh, made me threatened all over and I felt displaced I felt um, out, I felt heavily threatened. At the same time, the quote unquote other on the um, H 
hatred that really didn't persist when I started to interview Hifazat Islam deep-rootedly. And then I think this is one of the journeys that I really got the eye or trying to achieve the eye of uh, being very engaged, but need not really entangled. Mm. And to be highly reflexive, but at the same time, very much aware that how things are going from my side of the story. I'm not even dared to claim that I have the whole story. I'm always doing that these are my eyes, my type uh, interpretation of the stories. And other way around, there are cases of bloggers who are of that part uh, made it a social capital, economic capital to go, went abroad, right? And uh, many of them actually kind of betrayed the whole uh, uh, spirit of the whole um, people as such. So, so this ne 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 negotiation will never le will leave us. So I would say that like 71, Shahbag will never leave us in our lifetime. I, that is, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, going back to Shritiapu's comment is so important one is that uh, one of the key features, one of the key aspect that I have seen that could be uh, seen new, that creating social capital through social media is a very important recent trend. One. Second, uh, for, a, uh, for a protester who resists or a movement activist, now uh, the mm -hmm. situation is that you need to fight both online and offline. So having this social capital of uh, um, people knows me, I'm kind of an opinion leader, I'm trustworthy, I can influence, and I have uh, social media presence is also part of a tool of resistance as well. Okay, so social capital could be used a big capital for uh, social movement and resistance as well. Coming back to Firoz, always asking the very brilliant questions is that, uh, yes, Firoz, uh, that even with this digital uh, economy uh, of this digital cap capitalism, uh, the process that we can see that it would be much, uh, it will be go under the skin very soon. It would be visceral very soon. Mm -hmm. And the thing uh, I think uh, mm, Tastimapa said brilliantly is that the mind hmm, that has been, there are two versions of the game is playing on. One is uh, social media is the tool at the same time, the society. That is one of my key findings. Social media is not only the medium, but the society is in itself you play around, right? So people are getting also smart, <laughs> thankfully, yeah, that, okay, I'm playing with this role. So the, the surveillance system that uh, bogged her down or a group of people down, that also gives the rise of, okay, how can I negotiate and go, go around with the game, right? These, these, these are the ways uh, actually people are uh, dealing with because and the project I'm working on is that how youth is actually responding to corruption in Bangladesh through digital media, right? Hmm. How? So uh, I, I, I have, because if you see, I will conclude with that. In the case of Shahed, you remember the Regent Shahed case, right? So this guy uh, build up his social capital through taking selfies with very powerful people, with his legacy, because it's one of my research, with his legacy of being affiliated with the powerful people, showcasing it, being brutal, uh, providing um, uh, switching parties and so forth, right? A proper neoliberal entrepreneur, <laughs> according to contextual in Bangladesh. But that guy was got the backlash because of this contextuality is that when people are agitated about uh, COVID-19 corruption, hmm, that moment, the government was not that flexible of that process. So there are, there are something that they cares, hmm, that something can happen that they assume. Without that, why they are investing so much money, energy, effort, right? Mm -hmm. To keep that this way. Hmm. So then these photos. I mean, can I ask uh, if you just so that we can okay, close last, up? <laughs> we okay, can yeah, up. last last one. So <laughs> okay. that for the yeah, that photos become the backlash. Well, people are accusing him that oh, these guys are being with him. 
these guys are fed with him. Then they need to came up in social media and saying that, no, 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 that was a party photo. I was not aware of that. Right. So maybe a pseudo, maybe not that a sense of accountability remains through social media. Thank you. Super, thanks. Um, can we, Lima, do you want to have the last word? Do you, would you like to respond to? Yes, I want think to add wonderful. Few words with Samina, uh, Piroz, uh, uh, and also with Shruti. Um, I think there, there's no shortcut or straight answer of Piroz's question. Uh, because uh, now we are living, it, it's true that we are living in a so-called digital Bangladesh uh, and virtual world uh, where our, uh, our ruling party, they are using different kind of weapon against us, like character assassination, leaking phone <laughs> record, leaking screenshot. Uh, so you have to prove yourself all the time. Yes, you're right. You are a good person. You're not a bad person. And sometimes you are tagging uh, as a uh, Jamaat Shibir when you are uh, doing any opposition. So within all this thing, I think we need to think in a new way. If we think that we can uh, organize ourselves uh, uh, in a way of 60s or 80s or 90s, I don't think that uh, we can uh, do something in this uh, new world. So I, I don't have any specific straight way, uh, but I think we need to think um, think more and we need to think about the mental state of uh, the people, how we can connect with them and how we can connect with uh, each of us. Uh, we need to think about this. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Leela. I will try to wrap up by thanking the speakers for such wonderful papers and provocative answer you know and the audience for such provocative questions and I mean it was just that sort of engagement is what we were looking for in this conference so I'm glad that it's got off to a wonderful start with this uh, with the first and the second panel um so just yeah a huge thank you but 